Hey everyone, welcome back. This week we're going to be taking a look at living out the gospel of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the book of James. It's James' letter to the 12 tribes that were scattered all throughout the world. You know, as we look at James, we're going to see something as we kind of bounce from Acts into James and how James uh, encourages the people to live out their faith with works. We're going to look at three different areas today in James chapter 2. So open up your Bibles to James chapter 2 as we look at how faith and works intersect and interact. The beginning part of the book of James, James chapter 1, James begins with a a lesson on and, uh, and writing on trials and temptations. You see in James' writing, he's encouraging the people that though they face trials and though they face temptation, and those are two different things. A temptation doesn't come from God, but trials do. Trials test our faith, where temptation comes from our natural fleshly desires that well up inside of us. And each of those, as those two things work in our lives, each of those test our resolve whether or not we have strong faith in the Lord. Uh, James goes on to talk about being listeners and doers, and not, not just hearing the word, but also living it out. And then he begins James chapter 2 talking about how uh, favoritism is forbidden within the church and that favoritism should never be one of the ways which we measure our friendships and how we do what we call church. Favoritism should never play a part in that. And then he begins a section about how faith and works go together so that our faith produces good works and our good works demonstrate the type of faith we have. I want us to take a look in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Everybody open your Bibles, turn there. Faith without works is dead. Starting in verse 14, we read this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This is such a powerful statement, and I really want us to stop here and wrestle with these concepts. You see, James believed that faith in the Messiah transformed people in such a way that they were different, not only in the way that they believed, but in the way that they thought and the way that they acted. You see, James believed that people who were transformed by Messiah lived differently in the world. Their faith produced something. Notice in verse 14, James says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, talking to the church, if someone claims to have have, uh, faith but does not have deeds? Let me give you an example of this. Let's pretend that somebody is standing in the middle of the road and there's a truck coming toward them. And the person uh, is standing at this in, in the road looking at the truck coming toward them. And you run up and see this person standing in the road and you yell from the side of the street, hey, get out of the way, there's a truck coming. And they say, yeah, 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 I see it. Uh, yeah, I see it, for sure, for sure. As that truck barrels down and hits them, boom. Where was their works, right? They said that they saw the truck coming. They had that faith that the truck was there but they never moved, right? They never got out of the way of the truck. Was that faith real? The answer is no. They stood there not believing that the truck would kill them if it hit them. Instead, they faced the consequences of disbelieving the truck's effect on a person's body. Likewise, James is making the point here that if somebody claims to have faith, saving faith, in God, that that faith will transform them so that when you yell, get out of the road, they go, yeah, I need to move. And they jump out of the way because they believe firmly that that truck will kill them if it hits them. So James here is making this point, can faith that doesn't have action save them? Well, the truth is the faith that they had or claimed to have wasn't really saving faith. It was a fake faith. It was a a, a phantom faith. It was a faith that didn't produce anything. It wasn't truly faith. And so Paul, uh, James, pardon me, goes on to say in verse 15, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, well, go in peace, just keep warm and well fed, 
and, and God will provide for your needs, but that person does nothing. Does that person have genuine faith? You see, James is making the point here that people with saving faith don't just say that they have faith, they live it out. They don't just say, well, I believe in God. I, I, I believe that there is a God and, and that he exists and that he made all things. Instead, they say that and they live and act in a way that demonstrates they believe it. Right? They live and act in a way that demonstrates that they are obedient to that God because God is the one who is the righteous and just judge. They live and act in accordance with their faith because they believe that God made people in his image and people are to be cared for. And you see, James here is encouraging the people that faith without works is dead. You know, you and I who are watching this video right now proclaim faith. Right, we're in these groups, we're in our life circles, we're, we're meeting with people and we're talking with people. We go to church and we have families and we claim faith. We claim we believe in Jesus. But the question I think that James raises here, do we live what we say we believe? Right? Do we live in a way that reflects what we claim as our belief? It would be crazy if a Michigan fan wore Michigan State stuff. It would be crazy if a Michigan fan wore Ohio State clothing. It's crazy if, if, you, if you're a fan of Michigan State and you wear Indiana clothes, because if you are a true believer in that team, you do and wear and reflect what that team wears and does and values. So if you're a Michigan fan, you wear Michigan clothing. If you're a Spartan fan, you wear Spartan clothing. If you're an Ohio State fan, you wear Ohio State clothing. If you're an Alabama fan, you wear Alabama clothing, right? You wear the gear that reflects the faith or the belief in the team that is your team. Likewise, believers in Jesus should reflect the fact that they have faith in Jesus. It's not dead. It's alive. It's vibrant. I think it's such a powerful reminder for us that we need to be caring for people who are poor, people who need our help because it reflects our faith. You know, James makes the point that this brother or sister is one who's a part of them, not somebody necessarily from the community, but somebody who's a part of the, the faith community. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't help people who are a part of the community as well, but we need to help people who are a part of our own faith community too. So I think there's just a lot of a, to think through here and a lot to process. Are we living our faith by our works? Do we care for people who walk in the doors of the church, uh, no matter what background they come from? Do we care for people in, in our family or our life group, no matter where they come from or where they've been? Do we love people enough to give ourselves to them wholly? If we go all the way back to the very first lesson we taught in Acts chapter 2, where we talk about the early church and the picture of the early church giving and loving and caring for, are we the types of people who give and love and care for others within our own church and our own community? It's a question I think that James poses and it's a question we need to ask ourselves. He goes on to say, not only is faith without works dead, but he says faith is proven by works. Let's open to James chapter 2, starting in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I think it's important here to highlight, I will show you my faith by my works. Our faith in God and in Jesus, uh, his son and the resurrection, shouldn't simply be intellectual assent. Well, the more knowledge that I have of God and the resurrection, that's what's gonna save me. That's called Gnosticism. It was an early church heresy where people believed that the body, the physical, was bad and the only thing that people needed in order to be saved was mental assent, knowledge. And if I just have the right knowledge of who God is and what Jesus has done, well, I'll be saved. That's Gnosticism. You see, right knowledge combined with right heart change and right living demonstrates our faith. Okay, and before you condemn me as a heretic, listen to me on this. 
I am not saying that our works save us. I'm saying that our faith, our belief, like we talked about in Romans uh, chapter 10, our faith is what saves us. Our belief in God is what saves us. But our works demonstrate that we are truly believers in Jesus. You see, faith is proven. It's demonstrated. It's revealed by the works we do. Think about it. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm a fan of the Red Wings, but they constantly wear gear from another team, do you believe them? No, that's crazy. If somebody tells you that uh, they love dogs and all they have at their house is cats, and every time they come over and see your dog, uh, they kick it away, right? Do you believe that that person loves dogs? The answer is no, of course not. Nobody in their right mind would believe that person's a dog lover. The point is the same as what James is making here. If you claim to have saving faith, your works will demonstrate that in your life. I will show you my faith by my works. Other than your verbal confession, if people were to ask you or look at you and know that, that you're a believer in Jesus, other than your verbal confession that you're a believer in Jesus, would people be able to tell that you're a believer in Jesus by the way that you talk, by the things that you do, by the places you go, by the friendships that you make, even by your attitude and mood while you're at work. Will people be able to tell those things just by looking at you and being around you and getting to know you? You see, that's the point James is making. If, if your life doesn't reflect your faith, where is your faith? Faith should affect every aspect of our lives from the way we talk, the way we work, the way we interact with people, the way we uh, engage with friends and family, our attitudes, all of those things should be changed by our faith. And James is making this point very, very clear. I want us to keep moving here and take a look at faith in James chapter two, starting at verse 20. Faith is made complete by works. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that his faith and his actions, they were working together. And his faith, faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Faith is made complete by works. Let me give you the story of Abraham and then I'll hit on the story of Rahab briefly. The story of Abraham really begins in Genesis chapter 12, but Genesis chapter 11, but Genesis chapter 12 is really where God addresses Abraham and promises Abraham, it's the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant, promise him a great nation, safe passage, and, and promises to bless him and all of the people he comes into contact with. Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 are key verses in all of scripture because it really lays the foundation for the beginning of God's people, the nation of Israel. So in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham sets out on his journey believing in God. And on his journey, he encountered a number of different people in a number of different circumstances. And all through those, he had ups and downs of demonstrating faith. There was one scene though in Genesis chapter 15 where God caused Abraham to fall into a sleep and there uh, he made a covenant with Abraham. And in this covenant, he promised Abraham that he would provide, he would bless, he would be Abraham's God. The thing that required a response was that Abraham circumcise all of, all of his uh, offspring, all of the male offspring in his family. And that was the sign that they were a part of the covenant. And we read in Genesis chapter 16 that Abraham was justified by his belief in God. It says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as faith. And so we see in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 15 and 16 that Abraham was justified. 
He was saved. He was declared right by his faith in who God was and who God said he was going to be. And then later in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham demonstrated his faith by taking his son Isaac up to a mountaintop to sacrifice him because God had asked him to do that. And in that moment, Abraham, as he laid Isaac out on the altar that he built, went to slit his throat and drain his blood. And God stopped him in that moment and provided a ram to take Isaac's place. It was a moment of great demonstration of Abraham's faith. See, we like to say it was a demonstration of, or it was a, a great example of faith, right? Abraham's faith. But in reality, Abraham was working, right? He was doing something to demonstrate his faith. Now, James uses that story here in James chapter 2. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac? The two go together. His belief that God is who he says he is and, and he's going to do what he says he's going to do, coupled with Abraham's response in faith, sacrificing Isaac. Those two things coupled together. His faith justified him. His actions demonstrated that his faith was real. And that's exactly the point that James is trying to make. And he uses Rahab as an example as well. We know that Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. And the spies went out into the land to spy out the city. And there they came across this prostitute Rahab. And she said, I will house you in my home. You can stay on my roof underneath some uh, thatches where, where the roof is built, some, some branches that are up there. You can hide up there and I will tell the, the prison guards when they come look for you that you went the other way, or the city guards. And the only thing that I ask is that when I hide you and when the Israelites come, that you will spare me. You see, it was in that moment that Rahab demonstrated great faith. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, you see, Rahab obviously believed that the Israelites were the people of God and that God was truly powerful. If she hadn't believed that, she would never have hidden those men and lied about their whereabouts to send their captors off into a different direction. Instead, she would have, she would have called the city guards to come and get these men. But her faith made her do good works and protect those Israelite spies so that they would spare her life when they came to, to bring down the city. It's a powerful reminder, these two stories, that faith without works is dead, that faith and, and it justifies us and our works demonstrate that, but then also faith is made complete in our works. It's solidified, it's grounded, it's firmed, right? It's confirmed and it's made whole. I would encourage you this week, really consider the faith that you have. I'm sure many of you watching this believe that Jesus is the true Son of God. And you believe that Jesus died and rose again for your sins. You believe that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I believe that many of you believe that. The question is, do you live that? Is your lifestyle reflective of the faith that you claim you have? Faith and works are not opposites of each other. They work together. They come together in this intersecting way where our faith is what brings justification and our works is how we live out our faith. There's another word along with justification and it's called sanctification. I've used this word before. A justification means to be declared righteous in God's sight. But sanctification means to be made more holy. The, the word sanctify, uh, hagios uh, in, in Greek, is, is to be made more righteous and more holy. So we're justified, we're declared right in God's sight because of what Jesus has done on the cross and our faith in him. But then we live out our faith by our works in the process of sanctification, where we become more and more holy as God calls us to be holy. We saw that in 1 Peter 1 and verse 15. So remember that this week, when you go out into the world, are you living a life that demonstrates your faith? If people were to look at you and you were to, to 
never say a word to them about being a believer in Jesus, would they be able to tell by the things that you say, the places you go, the, the actions that you have, your attitude, would they be able to see Jesus through you? If the answer is yes, then I would say that your faith is confirmed through your works. And if the answer is no, I would encourage you, ask God for strong resolve to live a life of obedience and holiness for Him. Write Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 10, tell us that we're saved by faith, but we're created for good works. And when we are justified and saved by faith, we're sent out to live a life of holiness for God. I would encourage you this week to live holy so all can see.